It's sink or swim, my friend. And if you're good at swimming, you gotta let the losers drown. Why'd you do it, Gary? Because I can! Because making little people like you and the morons who run this place eat out the palm of my hand feels great. But I never did anything to you! What if I've given you the chance? GTA, GTA 2, GTA 3, GTA Vice City, GTA San Andreas, GTA 4, GTA 5, GTA 5, GTA 5, G- When you think of good old Rockstar Games Entertainment TM trademark, what's the first thing that comes to mind? GTA- I, on the other hand, when I think of the big RS, is pushing a little dweeb down two flights of stairs because he asked me to throw itching powder at some jock's weenus. Fuck you, Sheldon. Something that ties in kicking a soccer ball into that idiot's face is a minigame and getting sexually harassed by most of the women in school. This game has it all, and today I'm gonna see every little nook, cranny, and hole of every kid in this game. You gotta stop saying that. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Bully, or Canis Canem Edit if you're from across the pond. Oh, cheerio, cheerio, I left my biscuit in the oven. What the fuck do British people even contribute to society? Bully is a game about a man named Jimmy Hopkins, and he, he's what? He's 15? No, that is a 38 year old man who has seen some shit. But despite the name, you aren't actually the bully in this game. Most, most of the time. So hold on. I sure hope nothing bad. Save it for someone who cares. Fuck you. The kid. <laughs> Loser! Fuck it! Give me your book. Give me your- I got a book. And this little man-child thing is being dropped off at a boarding school known as Bullworth Academy. And it is just filled to the brim with the worst types of people. Arms dealers, serial killers, and- And Algy with his hand down his pants. Because- uh, I've been expelled from anywhere halfway decent because I'm really bad. And right on cue, this is Gary. The first person this game truly introduces you is this snot-nosed punk-ass little bitch tries to get on your good side so you guys can take over Bullworth and run the school. You know. Like all 15 year olds want to do. I'll talk more about Gary later, but for now I need to get to Mr. Crabblesnitch, the school principal, for his initiation. You're gonna do what with my holes? You will have a clean nose, so keep it clean, or we'll clean it for you. Yeah, stick your fingers in me. Not in that one. After whatever that was, we have to go through the combat tutorial, get brain damage, and change into our school uniform, and meet your soon to be best friend. Pete Kowalski, otherwise known as Femboy, the girliest boy in school. Petey isn't seen too much in the main gameplay, but in the story, he's Jimmy's right hand man and the guy that will have Jimmy's back no matter what. As we make our way back to the main building, Gary wants to show us around the school and give us a tour of sorts. Mm. Oh, I'm being sexually assaulted! <laughs> and on this tour, we are introduced to the five main factions of the school. There's the bullies, the nerds, the preps, the greasers, and the jocks. Each one with their own personality, trait, and style, but we'll dwell more in depth on them all throughout each chapter of the game. For now, we're focusing on the bully. These guys are a weird combination of all the groups, but they're the perfect starter faction to be introduced to. There isn't much to note about them other than the fact that they're just bullies. They all wear white polo shirts and pick on kids in school. We constantly see them tripping people, shoving people into trash cans, stealing textbooks, and now they're turning on you because this is what we do to teachers' pets around here. You better not. But first, chemistry. Good job. Keep paying attention. Holy mother of God! 
This is a school, so obviously the students must attend classes every day, and I think this is such a fun, unique way to go about this system. Instead of having a Nothing Burger cutscene play, you actually have to play different minigames to see if you can pass the class or not, and I think that's a great mechanic. Teachers will try to catch you if you're skipping class, students will be more scarce on campus when class is going on, and with that the whole school just feels alive. Yes, you'll see Aldi walk by 8 times in a row, but everyone is where you would expect. At 8am they're walking to class. At lunchtime, everyone's in the lunchroom having their healthy dose of ham and blood. Mm -hmm. After school, people are spreading out into their quadrants of the campus. The world feels alive in its very small but varied areas. But enough about the nerd shit, let's get to the fun part. After killing the head of the bullies, I go back to school and take English class? I thought we were done with the nerd shit. L lemon, uh, f uh, elbow. Well done, James, well done indeed. After class, Gary takes me on a little walk to test out my own slingshot, and boy howdy, it's, it's alright I guess. We get a better one before we even use this one again, so it's not that important. But on that same night, Gary takes us to go beat up the homeless guy behind the school? I'm beginning to think this Gary guy might not be the best person. On the second day at good old Bulls Balls, I start off the day by checking out the library where we meet God himself, Algernon commonly known as Algy, but his penis is out 24-7 and there is nothing you can do about it. After barely making it to art class and creating a masterpiece, I went to gym class and I beat the soul out of Fatty, that's his legal name by the way. I went back to the boys dorm where I found Gary and Petey being Gary and Petey, but Algy comes in screaming about his Bucky getting picked on, so I deal with that and now I have a new skank board. For some reason, Jimmy decides to go sneak around in the girls' dorm and is caught by Agnes, who tells him to go poison the head cheerleader, and I mean, who doesn't love a little class fun like attempted murder? So I do that, and then she has the audacity to make me go break into the school to steal back her diary because apparently this wimpy kid has some sensitive information in there. At this point, I'm beginning to think Jimmy just likes being told what to do like a nice little cuck boy he is. But hey, you gotta kiss. And, and probably a few STDs. He should probably go to the school nurse. Day three at Bucky Boomsters and it's Halloween. But that doesn't mean we get to skip out on class, chemistry, English, and now the fun begins. The search for class president is on and Ernest needs some help keeping the jocks away from his, oh, oh. Oh no. Okay, moving on from the fact that we just helped Adolf nerd Z himself, we got this cool slingshot now, which is pretty cool. I swear to god, if any of you ever mention that speech again, I will take this slingshot and I will put it straight up your ass. Halloween time! After a long day of helping out weirdos like that, we got- Oh, come on! Again? Twice in one day? Again? Halloween is fun. We pull a few pranks, make a dog shit, do some more prank- Wait, what was that the second thing? Day four of Bull Sprinkles. Day four of Bull Sprinkles starts out pretty normal. I went to art class, gym class, I helped the kid Melvin get some G&G &G papers back, and then I went back to the dorm where I found Gary. He says he has a plan of sorts and it's going to change everything. And well, he's right. You wanna run this school? I wanna run this school. Only one of us is gonna make it. And it's gonna be me! Gary has been pulling the strings from behind the scenes this entire time, destroying your reputation throughout the first chapter, and all culminating with sticking the biggest kid in school on you, Russell. Why'd you do it, Gary? I thought we were friends! <laughs> friends? You and me. I've taken dumps that had more brains than you, friend. Gary Smith is the main antagonist of this story. Yeah, it was obvious from the get-go with how he treats you and everyone else, and his big plan for school domination, but I can't begin to tell you the betrayal I felt when this man threw me in the hole and turned his back on me. He has been spreading rumors and lies about you all throughout the school, ultimately making every single faction turn their back on you, and now it's time for you to change their mind one at a time. And now that the school has opened up and the town of Bullworth is at your fingertips, it's time to start our climb to the top, starting with the preps. Nice trophy. Here, let me see. Come on, hey! I just speak this way because I'm very insecure. Day five starts out with us being approached by one of the preps telling us to come down to the boxing gym. But we'll be going there later for a different reason. The day starts off normal as can, going to the new shop class where we get to mod our bike and upgrade it throughout the game. After that, we help the school lunch lady get some chores done, help cover up the teacher's alcohol addiction, you know, normal school behavior. And then we went to the movie theater where we met Pinky. She's the one and only girl in the preps, and she wants to see this movie bad, so of course, like the submissive and breedable man Jimmy is, he steals a bike, kisses Eunice, 
and just kind of looks at the gay couple so they run away. This game was made in 2005 so the fact that there are so many openly gay students in this game and you even play as a bisexual man is well beyond its time and very telling of what type of message this game wants to send. This game, while well, despite the world judging it on its name alone, thinking it's a Columbine simulator, real quote by the way, shows that no one who actually critiqued the game actually went in depth on what the game expresses. The entire premise of this game is that the main character Jimmy is trying to change this awful dump of a school into a thriving community that helps everyone rather than gives him wedgies and swirly. This is what you get for calling my mom your mom and that your mom is actually my mom and that my- The way he does it is unorthodox but that's where the fun lies. Who wouldn't want to beat the shit out of every bully they ever had so they can learn their lesson and join the good fight with three dogs? Wrong video but you'll see him another time. The amount of inclusivity that this game provides is truly an interesting time capsule that we can look back on and see even back then there were people fighting for the rights of everyone not just people who already had them. With that being said though the prep storyline isn't really the best time to be talking about accepting everyone's sexual preference because um because first cousins is legal my friend legal yeah okay I think Pinky likes him so with that being said, let's go get some crabs and then absolutely dominate everyone in this boxing tournament. Throughout the game there are these red stars that pop up for each faction with a certain themed challenge in order to unlock a new safe house for Jimmy. And this one is a boxing tournament for the lighthouse, so one, two, three, and the lighthouse is mine. Day six of bull. Shut up about my shirt. I don't have a choice. Uh. In order to deal with the newest faction in the game, I have to look and sound the part of a rich white kid who came from wealth and eggs, apparently. These kids love their eggs. We had to get this weird little sweater for him in order to get in with them, which only lasted for a few minutes before the cum guzzler himself arrives and stirs the pot once again. You've been rude about mommy! Let's get this, Papa! At least now I can take this goofy sweater off, and to get back to the preps, I'm going on a date with his... Cu cousin? Girlfriend? I don't want to think about it. So I shot some people, dunked a midget, hit a hammer, and won the love of a witch girl with a big stuffed bear. After that amazing date, Jimmy was feeling himself, so he went to this adult entertainment store and found his gym teacher looking for naughty boys? Uh, I, I'm looking for naughty boys. I, I mean, I'm looking for naughty boys. Then he tells us to go take used panties from the girls' dorm. Five bucks? Alright, deal! Day 7, and I'm not proud of what happened last night. But bright side, Petey! Pete lets me know that there's a bike race going on, so of course Jimmy wants in, but Petey gets left behind. Poor Pete. But after a quick and easy race, we got a trophy, which is immediately stolen, so now we have to go teach them a... We gotta... Jimmy? Jim? What are you... What you doing there, bud? Well, we got the trophy, I guess. So we head back to school to get to class, but first we gotta take Algy back to the library, then gym class. Hopkins, I was wrong about you. Maybe you really are a really strong girl. Thanks for that. The biology teacher calls us into class. We gotta kill this thing called the Crapula Maxima. And in order to do that, we have to- Oh no, not again. The hair too! Fine, let's go kick some creppy ass. We headed to their hideout to have the most epic boss fight ever. Threw a child down a flight of stairs. Oh, he's for sure dead. And we're done. Day 8, we got shop class and I got my hair buzzed again. And now it's to Tad's house to get some revenge for all the eggs that have been thrown at me. And holy shit, it's a zombie horde out here. And after that, we find Petey on a dock and we're looking for some advice on how to beat those rich kids into submission. Well, what have you tried so far? Random violence, widespread destruction, gratuitous sadism. No, no, that's not gonna work. So Petey suggests we go beat their champion in boxing. So of course, we abandon Pete to go do that. And damn, Jimmy's really gone from this little cuck boy who lets everyone step all over him to the champion, not only of boxing, but now just about half the school. With all the preps now ordering to Jimmy, I think it's a good time now to talk about how interesting this game deals with stereotypes in each given click. You got the nerds being antisocial weirdos obsessed with chemistry and dragons, but with that, they also have such a united fronts against their enemies. And they Use their brains to their advantage in more ways than one and we'll see that very soon but then we have the preps who all came from money and are always just talking about how much better they are than everyone and stepping on the poor so seeing them get their metaphorical beans baked is a nice change of pace but now we move on to the other two stereotypes with of course the jocks being the big popular kids that no one messes with and the next faction to step up to jimmy the greasers headed by johnny vincent have you had what are you doing who laugh at me you turn on me you get it on with that harlot who I, I love? 
my woman. Now you pay. You're done, kid. Finished. The Greasers are a group of kids who are very obsessed with the style of the 60s, talking with their little New York accents. That made at least one person mad, fuck you Dennis, and wearing either leather or denim jackets. Whenever I see them, I can never help but to think of the outsiders, and I have to assume that they are heavily inspired by that story, especially in the final mission. But besides the grease balls, big news, it's winter. Now I don't know how long ago the final chapter is closed, so I can't really continue counting up the days, but just know some time has passed. But as me and Petey play guitar... What? But as me and Pete play darts in the boys' dorm, a greaser comes up asking for help from Jimmy. So after absolutely destroying Pete both in darts and real life, we head out to see what's going on, but not before getting Jimmy some nice winter clothes and his Christmas gift from his mom. It's all the winter clothes. For an early stage Rockstar game, it's surprising how much customization this game has. Like this game came out around the same time the early Grand Theft Auto games, and much like San Andreas, it seems so far ahead of its time in terms of the things that the game allowed you to do. You can get haircuts, buy clothes, wear work uniforms, hell there's even a ninja outfit you're in at the end of the game that makes you literally invisible to everyone around you. The customization is limited, but in an important way, because after all you're still playing as Jimmy Hopkins, but now he's just in a funny fry hat. Anyways, back to the drama. Johnny suspects his girlfriend Lola of cheating on him, and well, she is, with like, every guy in school. LG's face when he sees his queen cheating on him is just the funniest thing I've seen all day. But after proving Johnny right, he is very rightfully shocked. Damn. <laughs> hey, my bike! Dickhead! So we lure the preps to the bike park and... Dickhead! <laughs> kill them I guess? This school really needs to be put on a watch list of some kind. But everything's not all hunky dory finding Nemo around these parts because Audi is Johnny's next target and when we find him he's not the only one smooching the pooch. These are children. So they have to help them escape and Johnny doesn't take too kindly to that so we just decide to steer into the curve and fling ourselves off the cliff by spray painting on their turf. Somebody is gonna get their freaking lights knocked out! <sighs> Who could have that been? <laughs> I don't know. Got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> and taking Lola for ourselves. Jimmy really is the ultimate Steph Curry balls life Bullworth baller getting every single girl in school. So in order to show Lola he's a true lover boy, he goes into her old hangout spot to get all her things and in there we meet this fine gentleman. Taking out the trash. Looks like that's what I have to do. I just love so Jimmy's dead, right? Like he died there. Whatever, we got the package, got a nice little smooch, and now it's time to confront Johnny himself once and for all because there is an all out brawl that has begun on his side of town. So after beating his gooners, not the word, but we'll run with it, Johnny makes his presence known, and I love how subtly they change the camera whenever Johnny is on screen. It's a small detail, but it really shows you how much more of a threat he is than everyone else. But right on time, the cops show up, giving us one of the cooler missions in the game where we have to ride our bike down the back roads to try to escape the cops, like we're living out an 80s action movie in the game. We make it to Johnny's trap and it all leads to this, the fight of our life. Only one man can make it out on top and you already beat him? You didn't even let me finish my speech. Anyway, Johnny works for me now and it's back to Bullworth we go where Petey runs headfirst into the jocks. <laughs> now maybe next time you'll watch where you're going. What'd you do that for? Oh, I'm sorry Psycho, did oh. I hit your boyfriend? Yes, yeah, Psycho, you gonna try to kick our asses now? No, I think I'll do that more publicly. Ooh, I'm really scared right now, really Ooh. scared. I take down oh. linebackers every day, oh. pal. What? Jimmy, forgive me, but I gotta go. <laughs> but we're not gonna talk about them right now. We're gonna talk about something even better. Music. Hey, that's what he talked about last week! The soundtrack and bully scholarship edition back to school comma parentheses freshman year comma parentheses my gym teacher did what to me behind the bleachers has one of the greatest video game soundtracks in history and there is no debate about that so don't even try it or you'll understand why I have a yellow belt in taekwondo and a master's degree in ass kicking. The amount of bangers this soundtrack provides is unbelievable. There isn't a single miss. Everything from the walking theme that'll have you 
dancing around your kitchen at 3 a.m. because you forgot food exists, to the beautifully crafted vendetta themes that every click has. The songs perfectly encapsulate the essence of each group, the bullies having a generic but powerful beat em up style showing that they are a threat at the beginning but overall nothing special, the nerds having a very electronic video gaming style, the preps having a very bassy riff in the background but cascaded with these incredible guitar samples throughout that I don't know how to explain it with my stupid little nerd brain but it just feels like the rich kids are going to come insult you because you've had the same pair of Walmart sneakers for 10 years. And on the other side of that spectrum, the greasers have an incredibly fitting theme to show the style and era that they're trying to recreate. And it feels like you're running around the halls of the school because you and a ragtag group of misfits got detention and now you gotta, I don't know, find the meaning of life or friendship or something. <laughs> you're gonna look a lot better without these black curls in your hair. Hey, I like black curls. And finishing off with the jocks having a very school anthem feel, like you're watching a football game and oh, fumble, tackle, pass, throw, tackle, fumble, touchdown! I don't watch football. Most of the missions have specific songs dedicated to that mission, even if you only hear it a few minutes of one time. It's just so thought out and the effort that they put into this can't be overlooked. I don't know how they did it or if it's just the nostalgia talking to me telling me to go pants Melvin and shove a firecracker in his ass, but the class themes just make me think of that subject so perfectly. The sounds surrounding each one adding to the overall theme with shop class involving tools banging around, chemistry having a very intense rhythm backing the most stressful video game out of my childhood, and even the song that plays when a prefect witnesses you blowing up Sheldon like your name is Jimmy Oppenheimer will send shivers down your back cause oh no I'm gonna get in trouble and have to go mow the lawn. I still don't understand why that's the punishment for getting detention in this game. And the final two songs that play in the final mission are just mm, chef's kiss. I can't think of a better encapsulation of the entire soundtrack than those final backing tracks to one of the most enjoyable missions I've played in the game. But enough of the eargasm. I have to finish the story. Chapter 4 is the final nail in the coffin we need to fully have the school in the palm of our hands. All we need to do is show the jocks who's in charge. And apparently the nerds as well because they don't like us either now. So what better action to take than to verbally and physically abuse every single one of them, ultimately leading to their secret hideout behind the library with working potato cannons at every entrance. These guys really should be ruling the schools, but with how weak they are, it's just Jimmy's job now. After almost killing Ernest, he surrenders and joins the side against the jocks. And the first idea he has is to take over the funhouse to just piss them off, I guess. This mission is so unique and fun, and I just love how this game does that so often with one-off missions that don't really mean too much to the actual game but are just fun for the sake of being fun. It doesn't take itself too seriously like GTA or Red Dead because it doesn't need to. It's the GTA PG edition where guns are replaced with slingshots and murders are replaced with wedgies. So of course after that fun little mission we have to stalk the cheerleader and take revealing pictures of her to post around the school to embarrass her. I thought this was the nice version of GTA, what the f- So it's clear now that coming to Ernest for help was probably the worst idea Jimmy has ever had. So in order to make up for that awful act, he spray paints all the pictures that were put up, earning the trust and love of Mandy, the head cheerleader. This feels wrong. But no time for that, since after Ernest decided to invade the privacy of the Queen of the Click, the jocks rightfully want revenge, so we get to use the spud cannon outside to hold them off and give them permanent brain damage. And people wonder why they're so dumb. Oh, it's that little Squirt Hopkins. Yeah, that Squirt Hopkins. You're dead, Hopkins. Yeah, dead, Hopkins. Why don't you stop repeating everything he said? And with everything that's happened, it's finally time for the big game. The football game that everyone in the school has been looking forward to, and it's the perfect time to set a trap for the jocks. We lure the mascot into the empty pool in the gym, and after a long fought battle, we defeat and replace the mascot with ourselves so we can blend in with the football team and sabotage their things. You know, fun little student things like gluing the benches so they get stuck, putting marbles on the grass so they slip, that's not how that works, but just go with it. And even going as far to pee in their Gatorade, that's such a wacky thing to do. We also replace their footballs with active explosives. Does this count as terrorism, or? The big game has finally begun and Jimmy finally reveals himself to Ted, the quarterback of the team, as the man behind it all. And after being rained down on not only by water but grenades, I keep getting proved wrong that this is the kiddie pool version of GTA, we finally get to Ted and sack him to embarrass him and to fully take over as the king of Bullworth. Jimmy has finally made it to the top of the mountain. He's king of Bullworth and everyone looks up to him. 
but the things at the top aren't always better than they were at the bottom. After absolutely obliterating Petey once more, Jimmy, I gotta go. You aren't gonna go anywhere. The fellow Click members think that Jimmy shouldn't just be the head of Bullworth. Everyone should know that Jimmy Hopkins runs this town. So Jimmy climbs City Hall and spray paints Bull Worthless on it. That'll show him. And while Jimmy thinks he's really on top now, he couldn't be further from the truth. He comes back to find Petey in the dorm worried about him. All hell is broken loose at Bullworth and Jimmy is to blame for all of it. The library has been infested with rats, the gym is on fire, the preps got their trophies stolen, and Johnny Vincent got taken away to a mental institute. Every person in Bullworth thinks Jimmy is now public enemy number one. For all they knew, Jimmy came to the school, made them all look like jokes, and turned everything to shit. And Jimmy has to be the one to solve it again. Taking care of the rats, saving people from a burning building, breaking Johnny out of the asylum, and finding who stole the preps trophies. And it ends up being the local townies, who are former dropouts from Bullworth. But because it doesn't make sense to the rest of the school, they still blame Jimmy, including the principal. Jimmy is called to the front office the next morning, and when he gets there, the headmaster has been tipped off by a certain someone about everything that Jimmy's done including City Hall. And who else would have done that but- A commendable pupil did feel the need to tell me you were responsible for this outrage. Gary Smith! This whole time, we weren't fighting against Gary's plan. We fell right into it, gaining everyone's trust to ultimately let Gary break that trust one by one by sending everyone into chaos. Gary knew that Jimmy was naive enough to want the power for himself if he just got that one push from Gary about how he was the only one who could truly run this school. Jimmy fell for his plan at every single step and now the whole world has crumbled down on him. Jimmy is expelled from Bullworth and once his parents get back from their cruise, he will never step foot on the academy grounds again. And so brings us to the final character introduced into Jimmy. Jimmy's story, Zoe. Zoe is a former Bullworth student who was kicked out of school after Mr. Burton, the gym teacher, creeped on her and used his power to get away with it. So being the good and evil kid he is, Jimmy agrees to go get revenge on him with Zoe. They rig the porta potties in the town park so that when Mr. Burton gets into it, he is sent crashing down over the mountain after Jimmy rams into it with a lawnmower. And after literally shitting on his gym teacher, Jimmy and Zoe go down to Ted's dad's warehouse and have a competition to see who could break more items and cause the most damage. Jimmy is finally experiencing some happiness after everything that's happened to him, and him and his date are falling for each other. But the next day when Jimmy goes to see her, she's in a panic. She says the entire school is in a riot and all hell is broken loose. Jimmy thought he had finally gotten away from the cesspool that is Boltworth Academy, but now without him, there's no one to stop Gary from achieving his master plan. So one last time, Jimmy has to do the dirty work. He goes to Russell's house to try to get him to help, and he is prepared. So him and Russell smash into the old power plant where the town leader Edgar resides. And after making his way down to him and having an intense battle over a vat of acid, Jimmy convinces him to help as well. Jimmy really does just set the message of, if you want something, mercilessly beat everyone in your path. And I think that's a pretty good message to send to the younger generations. Jimmy finally makes it back to Bullworth, and with everyone by his side, now he has to stop the riot. Which means taking down every leader one more time. He teaches Johnny a lesson who's destroying the girls dorm, takes out the jocks in the library, finds the preps hiding in their own hideout and just beats them up for fun of it, I guess. And then he takes down the final group of nerds in the easiest fight ever. These guys really never were a threat. And now it's time to meet Edgar, who took care of the bullies in the main building. But the prefects take down Jimmy, steal his weapons, before Russell chases them off. And now all alone in school, Gary himself finally shows his face and leads Jimmy up to the roof for one last final showdown. After making his life a living hell for the last year at Bullworth, Gary finally takes his final step in his plan, and the only thing standing in his way is the man who has been a thorn in his side this whole time. Jimmy and Gary stand off against each other, Gary trying to run up to the bell tower while Jimmy chases him down, and after everything Gary put him through, he's not letting him get away this time, and they finally make it to the edge. The thing is, if I win, you're just another punk! You win, and you'll be sent away even quicker for beating up the head boy! Why'd you do it, Gary? Because I can! Because making little people like you and the morons who run this place eat out of the palm of my hand feels great! But I never did anything to you! You would've if I'd given you the chance! Face it, I'm smarter than you! Oh, congratulations! <laughs> You're smarter than me! You hate everyone, and everyone hates you! Genius! The head likes me! I tied him up, turned his dumb school into a battleground, got kids expelled, unfairly, put several others into therapy, and he still likes me! You're such a loser! 
Well, at least my mom doesn't make her living on her back! You're dead! <laughs> Jimmy lunges at Gary, sending both of them crashing off the roof, falling through scaffolding, and finally through the glass ceiling in Professor Crabblesnitch's office. Everything that Jimmy has done for Bullworth, for his classmates, have gone unnoticed to them all blindly believing in Gary this entire time, and Jimmy had had enough. The game has always been about bringing justice to this lawless land that is Bullworth, and throughout all of his efforts and failures, the school ultimately ends up in a worse place than it's ever been. The entire campus is rioting outside, the faculty is hiding inside away from all the chaos, the leaders of the cliques have all been taken out, so there is nothing more than anarchy remaining. But in all his efforts, Jimmy won. Jimmy was never the highly acclaimed boy wonder everyone wanted him to be. His mother dropping him off at every boarding school in the country hoping one of them would finally tame him. But one after the other he was kicked out for any number of reasons. And when he finally decides to make a change for the better, he was kicked while he was down by the man that to everyone else was the perfect child. Top of his class, the future head of school. Jimmy was the only one who saw the truth behind Gary's plan. And just like every time before, he was kicked out of school and he had finally decided enough was enough, and one last time took matters into his own hands and sacrificed himself in order to somehow bring peace to the school and town of Bullworth. At least, that's what some people like to believe. You see, that's not the story Rockstar portrays to us. After besting Gary on the roof and falling through the ceiling, Jimmy finds Crabblesnitch tied up in his office and he states that he heard the whole thing and that Gary is expelled. Jimmy unties him and he finally sees what Jimmy has seen this whole time. He grants Petey the ultimate title of head of the school, he gives Zoe her spot in school again and fires Mr. Burton, and he takes everything back that he said to Jimmy and he's no longer expelled. Jimmy walks out into the sun where everyone in the school cheers him on and he gets one last kiss from Zoe. Roll credits. And after the credits roll, it's like nothing ever happened. Everyone loves Jimmy again, Gary's gone for good, and as the title of the chapter entails, it truly is an endless summer. So, how? That story I gave you earlier wasn't the true ending of the game, rather a fan theory that has been acclaimed by many people in the community, because the real canon ending to the story seems too perfect. It's the textbook fairy tale ending, where the hero gets everything he's ever wanted and they all live happily ever after. But that only happens after him and Gary crash through the ceiling. The theory has never been confirmed or denied to my knowledge by the writers of the game, but in my opinion that's the true ending of the game. Sometimes stories don't have happy endings, but sometimes they don't need them. No one in this story deserved a happy ending. Jimmy tried to bring peace to the school, but he did so by attacking everyone and making them bow down to him like he was their king. And Gary manipulated everyone in the school in order to get what he wanted. There really never was a true good guy in this story, except one man. The true leader, and who I believe went on to become not only the head of school, but supreme leader of the free world. The man who ended racism and sexism, the man who solved world hunger and cured cancer, Pete Kowalski. Or Algy, I guess, he could have done that all too. No matter what the true ending is, or if we ever get an answer from Rockstar on if they'll ever revisit this title and make the long-awaited Bully 2, I think this game stands the test of time, and has and always will be my favorite game of all time. No game has ever been such a time capsule in the eyes of so many. Countless YouTubers ranging from every age has played this game and not only enjoyed it for its story and gameplay, but for how much nostalgia it brings. I found this game when I was only 7 years old, I hadn't lived through any of these years years, but it resonated with me. It gave me a feeling like I was living through the eyes of Jimmy, going to classes and solving everyone's problem. And as I grew up, I kept revisiting this game year after year until I had eventually graduated high school myself, and I revisited it again. But this time I had a different outlook on the game. Rather than being hopeful on the future, I reminisced on my past, looking through a lens into my high school experiences, and I know so many others have done the same. No matter how old or young you are, you can always get something out of this game, and that's the true beauty in it, and why I believe there will never be another game like Bully. If anyone actually made it to the end of this insanely dumb look into my past, thank you. It means a lot that you'd sit here and listen to me ramble on about this game, and I hope you stick around because this isn't the only Bully content you'll be getting from this channel this week, and this isn't the only incredibly long video I'll make, so if you like this one, like the video, show the channel some support by subscribing, and stick around for more ramblings from the idiot kid next door. It's been your boy, the dodgeball that got stuck in the rafters, and thank you for watching.